Diabetes Connections is brought to you by the only ultra-rapid acting inhaled insulin by Omnipod 5, the only tubeless pump that integrates with Dexcom G6, and by Dexcom G7, the number one recommended CGM brand. This is Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. This week, let's talk about LADA, a form of diabetes that is often mistaken for type 2, but needs to be treated much more like type 1. As you can imagine, getting the diagnosis wrong is dangerous, but it happens all the time. Jacqueline Haskins says she got lucky. You know, if I hadn't had the random good fortune to have that friend, I believe that I would likely still be misdiagnosed. I believe I would be sick, frustrated, angry. My doctor would assume there was something wrong with me, when in reality, it would just be that I was never correctly diagnosed. Jacqueline is the author of Kick-Ass Healthy Lada, where she shares research, advice, and her own story. She's an aquatic biologist and an award-winning author. This podcast is not intended as medical advice. If you have those kinds of questions, please contact your healthcare provider. Welcome to another week of the show. I am your host, Stacey Sims. You know we aim to educate and inspire about diabetes with a focus on people who use insulin. And if you've listened to the show for a very long time, you probably remember when I used to say, uh, we aim to educate and inspire for people with type 1 diabetes. And I very deliberately changed that a couple of years into doing this. I started the show in 2015, if, if you're new around here, so it's been a while. Like many people back then, I didn't really understand that there were many more different types of diabetes than just type 1 and type 2. And I didn't recognize that people with type 2 might use insulin and and different things like that. So that's why I changed it up. It's a little embarrassing because I remember years ago hearing about type 1.5 and thinking, "Ah, that can't be real. Well, of course, LADA or type 1.5 is real. And that kind of dismissive thinking can be really harmful, you know, when it comes from a doctor especially, but even from the general public. So quick information before we jump in with this week's guest. LADA is latent autoimmune diabetes in adults, just like type 1. It is a result of the immune system attacking beta cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. The big difference here, though, is the attack, the progression, is a lot slower. So the insulin production slows down differently than it does in type 1, right? It's very acute in most people with type 1. It takes a lot longer in people with LADA. It is still much faster compared to changes people see with type 2. LADA is most common in people over the age of 30, which is a big reason why it's misdiagnosed. A lot of doctors and healthcare workers think that, you know, any diabetes over the age of 20 is type 2. It's also tricky because LADA will respond to type 2 medications and, you know, lifestyle changes, exercise and diet and things like that for a couple of years in most people. But as the years go on and the insulin production goes down, you know, the A1Cs are going to go up even if people are doing everything they're you know, supposed to do. I've talked to others with LADA. I'm going to link up all those other episodes here in the show notes for this one as well. As you can imagine, it's pretty frustrating before you get the right diagnosis. And that is what happened to this week's guest, Jacqueline Haskins. She was misdiagnosed. She was frustrated. She was upset. And she's written this book, Kick-Ass Healthy LADA, to spread the word and share her story and help other people get the right diagnosis. She says she is a science-informed creative writer. She had a a career as a field biologist, and now she works at a local bookstore. She's an award-winning writer, and she's got a lot to say. I know you have a lot of questions about Afreza. Every time I mention it, the emails and the DMs come in. So what's it all about? Well, Afreza is an ultra-rapid-acting mealtime insulin. You breathe it in using an oral inhaler. Afreza gives you the flexibility to eat when you want, while providing proven blood sugar control. Afreza's ultra-rapid action allows you to inhale your insulin right when food arrives, even unexpectedly, so you can be spontaneous but still in control without the need for injections at mealtime. Find out more, see if Afreza is right for you. Go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Afreza logo. Afreza can cause serious side effects, including sudden lung problems and low potassium, and is not for patients with chronic lung disease, such as asthma or COPD, or for patients allergic to insulin. Tell your doctor if you've ever smoked, have ever had kidney or liver problems, a history of lung cancer, or if you're pregnant or breastfeeding. Most common side effects are low blood sugar, cough, and sore throat. 
Severe low blood sugar can be fatal. Do not replace long-acting insulin with a Frezza. A Frezza is not for use to treat diabetic ketoacidosis. Please see full prescribing information, including boxed warning, medication guide, and instructions for use on afrezza.com slash safety. Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, This is a topic that is definitely not talked about enough. So thanks for doing this and thanks for being here today. Oh, thank you. It is just an honor to be on the show. I really enjoy your work. So thank you for having me here. Excellent. All right. Well, tell me about Kick-Ass Healthy Lada. Before we jump into what the book's all about, what are you all about? When were you diagnosed? I know you were first misdiagnosed. Yes. Well, like so many of us, I was originally misdiagnosed and misdiagnosed as type 2. And it's really um, concerning how many people are misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. They say that one in 10 people told they are type 2 actually have LADA. So they're getting wrong treatments. They could be receiving dangerous treatments. And they're probably not getting the treatments they need or the perspective or advice. Yeah, absolutely. What, what was your story? So my understanding is that you weren't even feeling off. You kind of did this because a friend had a health situation? Yes. Well, um, it was thanks to a friend. And what happened was I was at the doctor for another matter completely. And because I hadn't had my blood sugar looked at in a decade, they were like, yeah, let's just check on your blood sugars. And then a week later, I got a letter in the mail saying, you have diabetes type 2. Well, actually, what they had done was they noticed that my blood sugars were out of whack. And then they just took a guess that it was type 2 because, you know, why not round off or Mm, (laughs) rounding error? (laughs) But then I had a friend who said, well, you really don't fit the profile. Has anyone talked to you about LADA? And I said, what's LADA? Because I had never heard of it. So thank goodness I had a friend who was well-informed, who knew that LADA was real and what it was. And once I started learning about it, then I went to my doctor and advocated to be tested because, of course, it's a very simple test. They just look in your blood for antibodies. And if you do have antibodies, well, then your pancreas is being attacked and you're losing your insulin-making cells. It's coming from that direction. It's that type of diabetes instead of an insulin-resistance type. Did you get that test right away? Did you get any pushback on it? Oh, yeah, I got pushback. But by that point, um, (laughs) yeah, they're like, oh, we'll just let an endocrinologist do the test. And by the way, it's four months till you can see an endocrinologist. And I'm like... No, that's not going to work for me. Yeah, (laughs) I want to know right now. And I just, I think they could tell I was not going to leave the doctor's office until they gave me the test. So yeah, I'm a very strong believer in advocating for yourself on this one. Well, you know, with diabetes, you generally have to. It's unfortunate, but you got to be kind of pushy about things. I hear so often of people who go misdiagnosed as type 2 for years. Oh, yeah. Um, Often four years, five years is common. And think of all that time lost to when you have an opportunity to be protecting your beta cells and that time is just being squandered. And then last week I talked to someone who was misdiagnosed for 16 years. Mm. And that's just heartbreaking. So I'm really glad. I really appreciate you helping bring this topic more into the public view because it, it just needs to be much more widely known. Yeah. When you heard LADA, did they say LADA? Did they say type 1.5? Like, what were you thinking? (laughs) They said LADA, and I was like, what? And LADA is such a funny name. And, (laughs) oh, there are all kinds of names. Yeah, diabetes 1.5. There's a strange name, Spidem, S-P-I-D-D-M. Yeah, there's a lot of weird names out there that are mostly alphabet soup. Mm. And back a decade or two ago, People thought that LADA was just type 1 that happened to adults. Right. But now the geneticists have teased apart the genetics and they say, actually, genetically, we're just a little different than type 1. So we're our very own disease. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no. It's, and it's important to have the, the differentiation yes. for a lot of reasons. What year was, were you diagnosed correctly? Oh, it only took me a year <laughs> to get correctly diagnosed. So I've had it for about four years now. I've been diagnosed. I think probably, of course, most of us are suffering an attack on our pancreas for many years before we get diagnosed. Oh, sure. Sure. So what made you decide to write this book? And correct me if I'm wrong, you're not a healthcare provider. You've lived it, which is, you know, half the battle. But you are a writer. So tell me about the decision to make the book. 
Well, really, it was just that sense of gratitude for having a friend. I was, I thought, you know, if I hadn't had the random good fortune to have that friend, I believe that I would likely still be misdiagnosed. I believe I would be sick, frustrated, angry. My doctor would assume there was something wrong with me, when in reality, it would just be that I was never correctly diagnosed. So I would be getting the wrong advice and treatment. When I think of how lucky I am, I just wanted to be that friend. I wanted to share what I knew and be that friend for others. And also in the course of learning about the disease, I did so much research. In fact, the book has about 400 references to scientific journal articles you can find on the internet because I did a whole lot of research. I do have a background in biology and biostatistics. So I was thankful that I was able to read those papers and understand them and make them hopefully more understandable for the general public. Yeah, it's very well researched, I should say. Lots of footnotes, lots of citations. In in addition to just letting people know that this exists and not needing a friend to tell them about it, you went a lot deeper in terms of helping people kind of figure out, I don't know, not just diet, exercise, explaining carbs and fats and proteins, but your journey of, do I need insulin? Should I be scared of insulin? And I'm curious what that was like for you, because it it did seem like you were very nervous around insulin. I was originally. And you know, I just think that there's so many misconceptions floating around in our society about diabetes. I think there's a lot of shaming and blaming. It's been shown that people who receive a diagnosis of diabetes can become clinically depressed, but it's fairly common. And I think part of it is the social judgment we sometimes face. And part of it is this misconception that we're going to never be able to eat dessert again or never be able to enjoy our favorite foods or that we're going to have all these terrible health complications. But in fact, as you know, none of that is true. We can eat what we want. We can have whatever adventures we want. We can be professional athletes or mountain climbers or attain any of those things we want. We can be as healthy as any other person. Really, there's no limits. Really, really, there's so much good news about diabetes. And once you know about it and understand it, it's so empowering. Yeah, it's a shame that there's the sort of negative bias in our culture around diabetes. You were saying all those great things, you know, people with diabetes can do these things and eat these things. I laughed out loud with your, when you told the story of going in the coffee shop early in your diagnosis and seeing all the delicious food and just getting angry. Can you talk about that a little bit? (laughs) For many of you, as you listen, this is going to sound like a weird question. Why do you use the insulin pump you've got on right now? There's a really good chance you went on that pump 15, 20 years ago because that's what your doctor had back then. And you've never really thought about changing. Well, that was us until Benny's pump company went out of business. And I was amazed at how much things had changed when we looked for a new one. I'm telling you, it's time to take advantage of what's new. If you need a sign to switch, this is it. Omnipod 5, the tubeless automated insulin delivery system is here and it's available through the pharmacy, which means that you can try it today, even if your tubed pump is under warranty. Fill out the quick online form, see if you're eligible for a free trial. Go to diabetes-connections.com Click on the Omnipod logo. For full safety risk information and free trial terms and conditions, also visit Omnipod.com slash Diabetes Connections. Yes. Well, at that point, uh, you know, I had no idea what type of diabetes I had. And I only knew I, I had absorbed this societal impression that that was it. Diabetes had just taken away my dessert forever. I was never going to get to eat any of the foods I loved ever again, I I mistakenly thought. And also, back in early days, I would pick up one book that would say one thing and another book that would say something entirely different, or I'd go to a website or I'd go to the ADA, the American Diabetes Association, and I was getting all this conflicting advice. And (laughs) that's really frustrating, right? So I had no idea. I knew that if I did it wrong, I might have a heart attack and have my toes chopped off and die a horrible death. 
but nobody was telling me how to do it right. It felt like, or too many people were telling me two different things, yeah. very different things. And I didn't know who to trust. And that's when I realized that, of course, diabetes gives us a superpower. All we have to do is pay attention to what's going on with our situation, our body, our blood sugars, and then we'll know exactly what to do. It's like we have a, a built-in compass. Tell me more about that, because I'm not quite sure what you mean. Oh, yeah. Well, you might say someone says, never eat potatoes. And then someone else says, eat this, but not that. Never eat this. Only eat foods that start with Q. <laughs> Whatever, random. <laughs> you know, people will put out the, some pretty random rules. Yeah, at that's time. true. Well, you just try it. Oh, well, here's an example. I was taking a diabetes class, which ended up being very frustrating because it was a type 2 class. And no one was acknowledging that, <laughs> that um, okay, now I, I like to say that type 2 food rules for someone with an autoimmune form of diabetes are like bringing a grapefruit spoon to a knife fight. Ah. You know, you just, they're just not powerful enough. So there I was in this type 2 class and a lovely person asked the nutritionist, She'd been hearing about probiotics and sauerkraut and was going to make herself a Reuben sandwich. And she said, well, how many pieces of bread? Should I use one piece of bread or two? Well, the nutritionist couldn't answer her question, but I wish I could go back in time. And actually, she never came back to the class. Hmm. I think she was so disappointed. But if I could go back in time, I would say to her, you have the power to answer that question. Try it with one. Try it with two. Try it as a salad. Try it with a half piece. I see. Test okay. your blood sugars and see what happens. Yeah. It's interesting that you phrase it that way, which I think is fantastic because I know, especially in the beginning, I, I didn't really see this as a superpower. I thought this as a giant <sighs> pain in the butt where uh, it's so unpredictable. How am I going to feed my kid? Right. Uh -huh. But I, I hear yeah. what you're saying. And at this point, right, everybody's so different that you you do have to kind of figure it out yourself. Yes. That's great. Yes. As the joke goes, you know, there's that saying, insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. But diabetes insanity is doing the same thing and in expecting the same results. Right, you know? right, right. We're, we're not only so different, but each day is different. And I talk about that and, and why that can happen. And so when we test, we do want to test multiple times to get a sense of what certain foods do for us. And sometimes they do different things in the morning. Sometimes they do different things when we're angry. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely they do different things when we just ran a marathon than when we're just lounging in our PJs. I also say it's a little bit like driving a car, right? You need a lot of information and orientation up front. No one just tosses you the keys and say, says, figure it out. Right. But once you get that information and learn the rules of the road, then you're making a dozen decisions a day to care for yourself. You have an interesting, if I read this correctly, you have an interesting lifestyle in that you use a, a snowmobile a lot, right? For transportation. Yeah. Before I start yeah. there, tell me a little bit about where you live and why, why that is that you would need a snowmobile. Oh, well, I have the great luck to have bought a little chunk of land near a little mountain town back, and this will reveal how old I am because we bought this land back in the 80s. And the situation is different now, but it's, it's, up a little, it's up a little dirt road that doesn't get plowed in the winter. So you can't drive in the winter. So, you know, you can walk, you can ski, or you can snowmobile. That's how to get home in the winter. I love it. But I love it up here. It's beautiful. I'm asking because I know when my son with type one started driving, we had to have a lot of rules and a lot of discussions and a lot of yeah. reasoning. Tell me about Lada and drive in a snowmobile. Do you have to do anything? Do you check before you go? Do you have low stuff, hidden places? I, I'm just curious how that works. <laughs> no, that's a great question, but it's true. You know, for me, probably backpacking is when I have to think about it the most, right? Mm. And cases for temperature protection for the insulin and backups and yeah, just double checking that all the supplies are there. For people who are sort of familiar with Lada, and I'll, I'll put myself in that category, I got some nosy questions for you. Like, I know it's kind of slower moving than type one for many people, but do you still have to really concern yourself with highs and lows? And 
Like I mentioned driving and you kind of like, well, backpacking is harder. But are you still, are you checking all the time? Is that something that you're concerned with? Do you have those ups and downs? You know, I like to say that we're all on a spectrum when we have diabetes, right? And it's like looking at a, a white, it's like standing on top of a mountain pass and seeing a whole sweep of mountains all around you. And each person with diabetes is standing on a different mountaintop. And we're all learning from each other, but we're also all in a slightly different place. So I have the good fortune that I did get diagnosed before I was in crisis. I probably still have some of my beta cells are still working. I'm still making some of my own insulin. Mm -hmm. And it's like I'm swimming with, I don't know, I'm in a life raft or I've got a life preserver on and everyone else is just dumped in the cold ocean. Not everyone else. And there will come a day when I'm probably when I'm fully out of insulin and then I won't have that life preserver. But right now, having just a little bit of my own insulin is this amazing cushion. I do have to be careful of lows. And I do, you know, it took me a while to get used to those alarms in the middle of the night and going, oh, I thought I nailed that perfectly, my insulin dose, but actually I controlled my high perfectly, but now I'm crashing into a bad low. Yeah, it's, it is tricky and it is scary. One of the things I was really interested in is that you talked about the profound change that you did and then you, you call yourself a carb crafter, right? So I laughed when I saw this because I think a lot of these steps are things that we, most of us do, especially if our kiddo is diagnosed. But yeah. then we, we didn't think about it this way. So you said boot camp, right? And then you, well, you take me through the stages there. Yes. And this is what I found helpful. And I was reading a little bit about the psychology of change. And Often what helps us change is a big wake-up call or something that really, really motivates us. So I certainly had that. And then you want to reset your habits. And so a lot of people go through a period that they might call a cleanse. I called it boot camp, where I just made really strict rules and I had to break my habits and break my dependencies and break down some of my cravings and form healthy habits. And once I was through that, then I could start experimenting because I think we don't, (laughs) I mean, boot camp, you know, helps us become the people we want to be in the future, but also nobody wants to spend their whole life in boot camp, right? (laughs) And we, we need to move past that and past that kind of very strict place that could become deprivation or food obsession that would be unhealthy. So we want to move past that and get experimental and add joy back into our lives and add the foods of our culture, add the foods that we love. And uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, that me in the coffee shop going, what can I eat? Nothing. My question changed over time to, wait, how can I eat what I want to eat? Mm. How can I eat the things I love in a way that protects my health? I love that because we did something similar. And when my son was diagnosed, we all went super low carb and that yeah. was it. We were not going to eat, you know, more than 25 carbs a meal or, you know, it was, it was really tough. Yeah. And then you, you start figuring out, okay, this is not sustainable. How do we do this? Yeah. And then eventually yeah. you find yourself like, whoa, we, we're, in a, we're in a restaurant. We can eat here. We oh, figured it out. Doesn't that feel good? I know. That's so empowering. So it really is. I also encourage people to trust time, to trust themselves, to just acknowledge it's going to take a little time. It's okay. You don't have to be perfect week one. You're going to get this. Just give it some time. Diabetes for everybody can be very inexact. I'm So I'm yeah. curious with Lada, how do you all manage that? You know, my son has been seeing an endocrinologist just about every three months, and especially when he was growing, it's, it's really just been recently that things have evened out, but you know, they would adjust things and adjust things and adjust things. Is it the same with Lada? Does it or does it change more slowly? You know, I think that in general, I mean, some people think of Lada as type one mellow, and that <laughs> that might be a, <laughs> that might be a little inaccurate or insulting. But I tend to think that that Ladas have an easier time often than type one. It's like things happen more gradually and gently and slowly, and we have a little more warning, which is a wonderful thing to be grateful for, and we can learn 
from type ones, all the fabulous technology. I, I don't know what I would do without my CGM. I love it. Well, I guess it's also fair to say that I'm still in the honeymoon stage. And that's another major difference with LADA is that if we get correctly diagnosed early, and that's why it's so important to find out as soon as you can, we can maybe protect and hold on to some of those beta cells for years, maybe decades. Nobody knows how long. And the longer you can keep just some of your own beta cells, the more you'll just have a safety net. Where with a type 1, I feel like you might be out on a tightrope, right, with no safety net, like it's just just you. But with if you have a little bit of your own pancreas left, you've got just that extra extra health, extra safety net. Yeah. After writing this book, which we haven't even really scratched the surface of, there's a lot more detail in here. What are your thoughts about your journey? I mean, you've advocated for yourself. You had to learn a lot. You've laid it out. There's lots of food. There's lot, you know, there's lots of information here. What did you learn and what do you really want other people with Lada to get out of this? Gosh, you know, in the beginning I was I was so grumpy. <laughs> and I was I was honestly I was devastated. I thought I had this horrible, deadly, confining, constricting disease. And I also felt like I wasn't even allowed to complain about it because if I did, people would rush in to say to, you know, to tell me all the diseases that were worse. Yeah. And how lucky I was. Yeah. And that's, that's really aggravating. It's not helpful. Um, but then, I don't know, a few years later, I began to realize how fortunate I am, how much support I have, how lucky I was to get diagnosed early, and to be able to read these research papers and learn and really know what was really true instead of, you know, all these diet gurus saying, do this, do that, and you can't evaluate it for yourself. So now I just feel super fortunate. And also, I just want to save other people some of those steps so that they yeah. <laughs> they can go to a handy chart and just look at a list of paleo, vegan, different ways to eat. And then, okay, how do those mesh up with carb craft? And I mentioned you were, you're a writer. Before I let you go, can you talk a little bit about that? And you're, are you working in a bookstore now that I see? Yes. For the past decade, I've worked in a, in a bookstore, mm. and it's lovely. <laughs> um, yeah, I love books. They're my, and before that, I was an aquatic biologist, and I, I loved that work. I got to pay to snorkel in rivers, oh, wow. which uh, if you've ever snorkeled in the tropics, I love snorkeling in cold, cold, freezing cold mountain rivers. It's just exciting for me. Do you still do that? What does it do to your blood sugar? I haven't done that in a little while. Yeah. Cold water is, I mean, you just have to pay attention. Yep. Absolutely. You know, I appreciated the thing online a while back where they had people with diabetes post pictures of themselves bouncing a balloon while doing mm. all the activities of life. So playing soccer, yet bouncing a balloon with one hand, <laughs> you know, nursing a baby, yet bouncing a balloon with one hand. It's more the idea that with diabetes, you're always multitasking. There's always a little part of your brain that's paying attention to your blood sugars. You know, when you'd love to just be able to focus on the person that you're with. How are you feeling these days? I mean, when you go back and see your doctors, do you, well, you don't see the same doctor that misdiagnosed you, right? <laughs> no, I'm really lucky. I have a fabulous endocrinologist. I just admire her so much. We get along great and I have, I mean, my blood sugars are down where if I were being diagnosed today, I wouldn't be diagnosed as having diabetes because my blood sugars are down in the normal, right. normal level. Right. And I'm staying in range 98% of the time. So yeah, I feel really fortunate. I think that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining me to talk about this. This is a great and needed addition to the diabetes bookstore that we that many of us have. <laughs> thank you. Yes. And I really enjoy the things that you post. So thank you for all the work that you do. I think that having a loved one might be with diabetes might be even harder than having it myself. Yeah, it's a different uh, road. You know, I did want to ask yeah. you, <laughs> this is huh. such a silly question. I may take it out. After talking to you all this time, the book is called Kick-Ass Healthy Lada. 
Yeah. You sound like an extremely intelligent person. You're very articulate. I'm trying to get the kick-ass part because I get the snowmobiling and you're talking about snorkeling in rivers, but you, you're just a very, you seem like a very soft-spoken, are you kick-ass person? Is this because of you? Is that kick-ass? Is it the, the, the name? Oh, I, maybe I'm the uh, speak softly and carry a big kick-ass I type love, person. <laughs> I love it. Perfect. Perfect. Mm-hmm. I'll end with that. I, I mean, I don't think I can top that. Thanks so much again for joining me. Oh, thank you very, very much. Take care. It was a real honor to be on your show. You're listening to Diabetes Connections with Stacey Sims. More information about Kick-Ass Healthy Lada in the show notes. You can also find our previous episodes on Lada there as well. It is here. The all-new Dexcom G7 Continuous Glucose Monitoring System is now available. Powerful and simple, Dexcom G7 is proven to lower A1C and help you spend time in range, all without finger sticks, scanning, or calibrations. There are so many amazing new features to talk about here. I'm not sure where to begin. Dexcom G7 is 60% smaller than the previous generation and is the most accurate CGM system out there. The 30-minute warm-up period is fantastic and is up to two times faster than any other CGM brand. And I love the all-in-one sensor and transmitter. To learn more, go to diabetes-connections.com and click on the Dexcom logo. Had a bit of a break from travel, but now we are here, there, and everywhere. Just back from ADA, the American Diabetes Association Scientific Sessions. Many more episodes to come on what I learned there. I'm heading out to Friends for Life. There's lots going on right now. I'm really excited to go to Friends for Life. I feel like this is the first big full one since before COVID. They've had it for the last two years, but I I really feel like it's going to be back kind of how it was before. And I I can't wait to go and and see people and and really just, you know, meet everybody that I haven't seen in a while again. I think this is the 10th year that I've gone to Friends for Life. I didn't even start going as a parent. I, I went, well, Benny went with me that first year. Animus sent us. I was a community blogger back in the day for Animus. And they sent me to do some video work for them, which was a lot of fun. It was great. And I I had never heard of Friends for Life. I'm so glad I found them. I've learned so much. I've made so many great friends. Hope to bring you some news and info in future episodes. As I'm looking at my calendar here, Benny is still at camp for a few more weeks. He's doing his college orientation virtually. So I have to check on him and make sure that that happens. Although he's got it. I don't really need to check on him, but I need to do something. I need something to do with that kid. He's gone all summer. And then he comes home for two weeks and he's gone for college. So I need to feel useful. So I'll let you know how that all goes. And we'll be talking a little bit more about college in August. I'm going to try to do an episode kind of about us a little bit, but more about accommodations and letting go and just, you know, stuff parents might want to think about or totally avoid thinking about because I just, I can't face it yet. (laughs) We'll cross that bridge in just a couple of weeks. Oh boy, that bridge is coming fast. Thank you to my editor, John Buchanan from Audio Editing Solutions. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Stacey Sims. I'll see you back here soon. Until then, be kind to yourself. Diabetes Connections is a production of Stacey Sims Media. All rights reserved, all wrongs avenged. I started drinking AG1 in the morning. It makes me feel so good. I mean, I'm ready to take on the day. I'm giving my body the nutrition that it craves. I am not one who has remembered to take a multivitamin very often. I buy them and they sit there. But AG1 replaces your multivitamin, your probiotic, and more in one simple, drinkable habit. It just takes one scoop. I get the nutrients and gut health support that helps my whole body thrive and covers my nutritional bases. I get the travel packs. I don't have to miss a day. And it tastes great. I just mix it into a smoothie and then I feel good and go about my day. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1, get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash Stacy. That is drinkag1.com slash S-T-A-C-E-Y. Check it out.